Uh, I, first of all, would like to thank Alice and the Architecture Foundation for asking me to uh, contribute to this series. Uh, as Alice was saying, I am uh, using the time given by this uh, particular situation to try to conclude uh, a book I'm uh, writing uh, on the work of Donato Bramante. Uh, the book uh, is provisionally titled On Bramante. And I, I'm simply working on it uh, in, in, in these days because other uh, sort of works uh, have disappeared. Uh, and strangely enough, uh, for people a bit privileged uh, like me, there is the possibility to work also during uh, this emergency. Uh, so what I will uh, now try to do is to share my screen and uh, introduce my discussion. That is a discussion of the relation of architecture and politics. I hope I hope it works. Is it working? Uh, Alice, can you unmute a second and tell me if you're seeing my That's good for me. Yes. Okay. okay. So um, this this picture uh, is, of course, a picture of the foul in Sao Paulo by uh, João Batista Villanova Artigas. And writing this thing on Bramante at a certain moment, uh, I ended up reading uh, this thing uh, that I think that has been written by Artigas in 1970 in a text titled uh, Arquitectura e Comunicação, so Architecture and Communication. If you allow me, I would do as if I could read Portuguese, and I read it uh, in Portuguese, because it's very beautiful, and then I will uh, try to translate. Uh, it's, it's significant uh, that, uh, that in these uh, circumstance, so it's 1970, uh, Villanova Artigas uh, just completed uh, the FAO, but was at the same time also fired as a professor by the uh, dictatorial regime of Brazil. Um, the, the coup in Brazil took place in 1964, uh, Villanova Artigas was a member of the Brazilian Communist Party and escaped to Uruguay shortly after. Then, after one year... Wow, in, what is going on? When, then, after one year, he, um, he came back and, uh, um, and still had the possibility to teach for one or two years. And then it was completely banned from the university uh, until the second half of the 1980s. Uh, but at the same time, he was allowed and also received the significant commissions uh, from uh, the very same dictatorship that first kicked him out of the country and then um, forbid him uh, to teach. So, um, Speaking of architecture and politics, I think it was in a particularly interesting uh, situation to talk about this because of this very complex relationship uh, with uh, political power uh, at the time. Uh, I tried to read uh, Artigas. Uh, ya Bramante tinha observado este dualismo. Seu projeto par Sao Pedro em Roma, ele o definiu a princípio como quatro colunas, os quatro apóstolos, que, que sustentavam uma cúpula, o seu. A cúpula é o projeto da comunidade, vive no seu. Sustenta, permita-me a imagem, não colunas, mas apóstolos. 
assim, o que vem definido a arquitetura na história, pelo menos a da civilização que nós chamamos de ocidental, é o projeto que a sociedade se impõe e que o construtor representa em um edifício. Uh, I shortly translated. Uh, Bramant had already observed this dualism. His plan for St. Peter in Rome uh, was defined at first as four columns, the four apostles, who held the dome, heaven. This dome is the project of the community. It lives in heaven. They support it, allow me this image, not columns, but apostles. So what has defined architecture in history, at least that of the uh, Western civilization, is the project that society impose onto itself and that the builder represents in a building. Um, I think this is uh, particularly significant. It's significant for me uh, because uh, Artigas, uh, in the moment in which he has to tackle this specific topic, that of the relation of society and architecture, of uh, architecture and politics, he feels the need to go back to Bramante. And it's also interesting because of the particular figure that Bramante was, uh, the, sorry, that Artigas was, so a communist intellectual in a post-colonial uh, context. So his uh, addressing of classicism is uh, done from a very uh, particular point of view, and it is done, uh, I believe, uh, in order to, um, to save what is possible to save from such a position uh, of what we can, broadly uh, speaking, identify as the project of uh, Western classicism. So for, uh, for Artigas, um, classicism, that was uh, no discussion, a component in the project of oppression, uh, was also something that was worth being saved. Um, in, the, in his text, Artigas says two things about architecture. So, architecture is uh, the project that no, society not. imposes onto itself, uh, or project. Um, on another level, uh, architecture is... Uh, the project that o constructor representa em un edificio. So the uh, project uh, that the builder represents in a building. So these two things that define um, architecture as something significant uh, for society are uh, completely uh, different. And I think this difference is crucial to this quote of uh, Artigas and crucial to a possible interpretation of, um, uh, of architecture and of its uh, cultural uh, value. So on one side, there is architecture as simply the project that society imposes onto itself. So the, um, the investment, the amount of money, uh, the, um, the, uh, the violence that is uh, um, invested into building something. Uh, and here, I think, uh, uh, somehow it also disappears the distinction in between pure quantity, uh, what is uh, significant in general, uh, simply in terms of the amount of resources that are devoted uh, by a certain society to a certain type of investment. And then uh, there is uh, the, other, um, the other aspect uh, that if we follow Artigas can be um, imagined by society on what to do with the resources available by, uh, by this society. And the second thing is the uh, formalization of that, the representation, how the builder, the, the architect, manages to give a form uh, to this investment that is not only uh, economical, political investment, but it's also an emotional investment 
uh, for a certain society. So it's starting from that by representing that and so by detaching the pure investment from the reflection on the form of such investment, the difference uh, that these intellectual uh, dimension enters into uh, the conversation. Uh, what is uh, uh, this aspect of the, of the work of an architect, I think is incredibly clear in a definition by Giorgio Grassi, and, and you see a drawing uh, by Giorgio Grassi, um, of the building as at the same time, uh, I read it in Italian, uh, oggetto e rappresentazione delle regole che lo governano. So buildings are at the same time the subject and the representation of the rules that are governing the building. So the building is at the same time the subject of these rules, its consequences of the application of the rules. And the fact that these two things do not perfectly coincide uh, allows uh, architecture to uh, appear, uh, to perform as. So architecture is public on two levels, on, on let's say on first level, the level of, of being busy with very massive major transformations, uh, and no matter if public, private, whatsoever, but it's also public because it's always a reflection on the way of doing this. And so it always show a method uh, how to um, distribute resources, how to attribute form to a certain set of resources. So architecture always have a methodological uh, value. Uh, every little small building uh, embodies a set of rules that could tendentially be extended to any other sort of problems and so implicitly uh, shows uh, a way to uh, transform reality in uh, more in general. So buildings are always models uh, for other enterprises. Uh, this is also the reason why uh, I disagree with, uh, uh, with Irene Scalbert's uh, uh, contribution that I, I saw before in um, saying that I don't believe architecture uh, to be a minor art. This ambition, uh, this methodological ambition is uh, something that is uh, typical of architecture. It's typical of our, it's uh, uh, related to architecture uh, only because architecture normally involves these massive investments, investments of money, power, uh, and emotions. Uh, and, um, and this condition defines the implicit ambition of architecture, at least of the architecture, as Artigas was saying, of the Western uh, tradition. Uh, it might be that in other uh, tradition, uh, architecture plays a slightly different role, uh, and, uh, uh, but I'm also not so uh, knowledge on, on these uh, situation. So I, I don't want to enter um, into this specific topic now, but I, I believe this is certainly typical of all the architectural tradition that, as Adolf Loos would put, started uh, with the Romans and is still based on the architecture of the Romans. So a very extended post-Roman uh, architecture. Now, if, um, if buildings means uh, just because they are in, in small, a, uh, they, they show a way to uh, address uh, the world in general and more, and more specifically, uh, every building has this link with the city and every building is somehow an attempt to imagine a new city, a new form of coexistence uh, for human being. And so if every building has these indirect political value, 
then there's a, a strange consequence that is that every building are, so to speak, the same in the sense that they all have the same responsibility towards architecture because they are all the analog of the city in general and they are always uh, tasked uh, with, uh, so to speak, all of the possible uh, problem of architecture. This is why, in a way, scale is so important in architecture and at the same time totally irrelevant and it and size is uh, completely detached from uh, the, the ambition that can uh, be attributed uh, to a building. Uh, for instance, well, this amazing building by James Sterling and this little thing that we uh, designed recently uh, that I don't show to you because uh, uh, of, of a specific quality that I cannot uh, uh, certainly uh, argue, but because of the desperate ambition that uh, uh, has been uh, put uh, also into this little pavilion for, for brewery in provincial northern Italy, uh, that is the same desperate ambition uh, that uh, uh, we can detect uh, at the beginning of the career of Donato Bramante for this little restoration of a Paleo-Christian chapel that measures all, all together no more than uh, seven meters. So another consequence of this uh, strange uh, injection of ambition into objects, even into small objects, and I think this is very clear in the career of Bramante in going from this little thing to this other little thing that is the model of this uh, gigantic thing that should have been St. Peter, that here you see in a cake that we produced a couple of years ago for a um, Bramante celebration. Uh, all of these uh, brings us to another cake that is this one, and uh, that uh, features in uh, James Sterling proposition for uh, Roma Interrota, that's uh, 1978. And Sterling proposes to substitute a, a huge statue of Garibaldi uh, that is in Rome with his uh, birthday cake. Uh, I suppose the, the, the puppet on, on top of this um, Corinthian column base uh, is Sterling himself. And Sterling introduces in, in Roman Terrota a, a interesting acronym uh, that is MFA uh, for megalomaniac frustrated architect that I think he uses uh, mainly to speak about Piranesi, but I think applies to every good architect in the history uh, of at least Western civilization again. And, and I think Sterling is, is very clear in establishing a relation to this immense ambition can be, that can be uh, attributed to every single building exactly because every single building is in, in small an attempt to devise a strategy to transform uh, the entire world so that uh, uh, by redoing the garage of my grandmother, I am implicitly devising a way to take decision on uh, whatever uh, possible form of coexistence for, uh, of human beings. So uh, if, um, and, and this um, level of uh, uh, crazy ambition, and at the same time, uh, absolute uh, consciousness of how ridiculous all of, all of this is, is the same that we can see here in the birthday cake of Sterling or in this crazy portrait of Balthasar Neumann uh, at Würzburg, where Neumann explicitly asked Tiepolo uh, 
to uh, paint him uh, uh, with his dogs uh, and in the um, uniform of uh, the army of the Bishop of Würzburg. By the way, the super mini, super tiny state uh, and, and this painting by Tiepolo um, represent this uh, uh, completely demented the triumph of this little German bishop uh, and all of the continents are paying tribute to him and in this triumph of nonsense uh, there is Balthasar Neumann uh, laying down on a, on a cannon uh, in the uniform uh, of the army. So uh, if architecture is this thing, so a uh, an investment of society and the reflection by an intellectual on, uh, on this very investment of society. It's also true that uh, architecture is always, uh, so to speak, uh, split. Uh, it's, it's always, uh, um, there's always a difference in between uh, the, the building in itself and the building at as a representation of itself. Uh, and, and it also means that keeping this distance inside of the very, of the building itself uh, also means that architecture will never provide solutions. So architecture is by definition not problem solving because if we, architecture would literally address a specific problem it would never be able to, um, to have meaning uh, as a model for solving all sorts of other problems. Uh, so this, um, and this is also something that in architecture doesn't appear as a, a, some sort of hidden meaning or some sort of symbolism, it's these double dimension of architecture is always given in the object itself. I think uh, uh, Bramante is probably the most clear example of this coincidence of reality and representation in the physical experience of space. Uh, but, uh, but I think we could find so many uh, also uh, other, other examples. Uh, Another consequence of all of these is that uh, if architecture, if every single problem of architecture is always a problem of all the architecture, and it's always a problem of method with always wide ranging implication, this also means, and that's something that I think all of our professional life proves every single day, uh, this also means that the architect is always unprepared and he is by definition unprepared. Um, to this, in this respect, I always found very telling the incredible list of skills that Vitruvius um, introduces at the beginning of his book. Like I think it's book one, chapter one. And he says the architect should be a musician, a historian, a blah, 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 and, and so forth. And, and these, uh, completely unrealistic definition of what an architect is, is uh, in, a, in a kind of um, inverted manner, uh, just a form of consciousness of how unprepared uh, an architect always is. And this lack of preparation, lack of specific, um, how to say, technical knowledge uh, is, I believe, uh, part of this um, implicit methodological uh, value of architecture. Architecture is so relevant uh, because it confronts problems that we uh, can consider uh, a model of any other problem, uh, and also because we are always incapable of addressing them. And the greatest buildings in, uh, in, in architecture, and, and I think the, this building by, by Bramante Santa Maria della Grazia is such a proof of that, 
are the ones in which this crazy ambition coincides with uh, this total awareness of uh, the uh, incapacity to fundamentally solve all of these problems. So, uh, and I, I think my interest in Bermante is in the end uh, fundamentally because of this, this extreme arrogance uh, combined with this incredible uh, capacity to, uh, to understand how weak and frail uh, human beings are and to give this uh, thing that seems to, so strange to, 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 to broadcast uh, with, with a medium like architecture that doesn't seem to, to ideal to expose these, I, this weakness uh, is uh, probably the, the, the most impressive thing that is possible to do in architecture and that is so impressive uh, in the architecture uh, of Romantic. Now, so uh, if we follow all of these, if we follow um, Artiga's uh, reflections on St. Peter, uh, we can come to the conclusion that our architecture is political, uh, but it is political only as art. So it is political only and directly as a model. Um, this also means that architecture, first of all, is not directly political. Architecture cannot save this planet, cannot save uh, panda bears, cannot do good. Uh, and uh, and this, um, this is also uh, something that in a way, uh, justify the search for beauty in architecture. Because if architecture could literally solve problems, uh, then it should do that. And we shouldn't have any interest for this more indirect uh, agenda. But in reality, architecture doesn't really control what happens uh, into building, cannot really contribute to the happiness of people and can only somehow control how uh, things that happens inside of building um, are framed. Um, so if we, um, if we accept that architecture uh, is political but only indirectly, uh, then it would seem that uh, uh, in a way there's no problem. So architecture is this sort of relatively separated realm that uh, operates according uh, to its own artistic logic uh, and that in a way uh, the, the horror of pure uh, power and, and, and and money and violence that uh, provides the opportunity for architectural reflection to appear uh, can be somehow exercised, so that can be uh, pushed away. Uh, in reality, uh, it is not. Uh, it is not like that. Um, because architecture needs to be built. And in order to uh, be built, architecture needs to secure clients and needs to convince them and also needs, uh, in order to make the most interesting experiment, needs to uh, use uh, immense uh, resources. This is, uh, uh, the case, uh, exactly the case of St. Peter, that I think in the history of uh, Western architecture is still the most extreme uh, of all cases. Uh, just to remind uh, a little bit uh, the uh, situation, uh, Bramante not only starts the construction of new St. Peter in uh, uh, 1506, but also 
convinces the Pope, or here we, we the, the historical um, this, the historical documents are not clear. It's, it's not really clear who convinces whom. Uh, and in the end, it's of course a, dis, a decision by the Pope, but for sure, Bramante puts a lot of pressure on the Pope to demolish St. Peter. And once he has the task, he raised the old church to the ground in the quickest possible manner uh, so that there would, there would be no way back. So um, this is a, a, what you see is a, a, video, a film still from a terrible movie of 1965 titled uh, The Agony and the Ecstasy, that it's fundamentally a Hollywood biopic of Michelangelo in which Michelangelo is played by Charlton Heston. But as minor figure, there are uh, Bramante, who's Harry Andrews on the left, and uh, Julius II, who is uh, Rex Harrison on the right in the picture. And among themselves is one of the most uh, uh, disgusting version of a model for St. Peter you can think of. Um, but, um, but this movie uh, somehow, uh, at, at least this picture, uh, somehow gives an idea of uh, what these two uh, figures uh, were trying to do. So the architect wanted to um, obtain all possible resources to go on with his uh, uh, artistic experiments in the configuration of space. And in order to do that, he tried to convince and actually convince the Pope to raise to the ground uh, the most important church of uh, Christianity. This, this is a situation that's really exceptional in the history of religion, that somebody simply destroys its most uh, holy uh, monument and destroys it without a ideological, uh, let's say a theological or symbolical reason, but only for an aesthetic program. Um, and this also tells another thing that um, architecture architecture is uh, made um, sorry I need So it's made uh, in, in this specific case with, uh, with immense resources. And, and these immense resources, of course, have been accumulated uh, following criteria that are in immediate contradiction with uh, the formal order uh, that wants to be uh, instated uh, through uh, architectural uh, production. So the political form that is suggested in these incredible architectural forms uh, is then to be realized uh, with uh, a political means that are of incredible brutality and, uh, and violence. In, in the case of St. Peter, it's, pre it's pretty clear uh, the, the money to build this amazing thing uh, should have been uh, um, taken mainly from Germans uh, in the form of uh, the selling of so-called indulgences, or uh, I don't know if I spell it correctly. Um, so the political means to uh, realize uh, these form are in immediate conflict with, um, with, the, uh, with the political 
ambition exposed that it these very same four uh, and uh, and this uh, conflict that uh, um, that start to uh, that, that, that takes place and it's immediately evident in the in the history of St. Peter because Bramante builds a little bit of it and then the, the church is in a state of ruin and then uh, it will remain as such for at least 50 years and uh, uh, for instance there are all these drawings by a Dutch um, uh, painter called Martin Panemska who have been studied in extreme refinement by a German historian called uh, Christoph Tönes uh, uh, and this drawing in a context of uh, uh, of Europe where uh, um, the Reformation uh, started uh, to act uh, were presented uh, you, you see these uh, parallel on the top is a part of the new St. Peter that looks like a ruin and, and below there are Roman ruins uh, in, 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 in these uh, and these on the top the Colosseum and, and below uh, the construction site that already looked like a ruin of St. Peter. Uh, these ruins look like the ruin of war uh, for conquest uh, of beauty. And uh, it seems that in the case of Bramante, this uh, experiment with, with beauty and with the political meaning of beauty has been uh, pushed uh, to the extreme. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that, um, that architecture as a representation of the, uh, let's say, of of power and of the violence implicit in human coexistence is at the same time a theory of this violence and a critique uh, of this violence uh, has been brought to the very uh, to the very extreme. It seems that, uh, uh, in a way, uh, anticipating uh, Machiavelli, but also in a way anticipating Lenin, uh, it seems that. Uh, Bramante tries to enact uh, beauty and, and, and formal clarity with, with, uh, with an original act of violence that will then later uh, be recovered by the very same quality of the beauty that can be produced uh, through that. But in reality, we all know how the story uh, ended up uh, and we all know that this uh, Leninist attempt at the conquest of beauty uh, didn't work out. And I think I can conclude here. Uh, you are muted, uh, Alice, I think. Pierre, yeah, Paolo, thank you so much. Um, and can you maybe can, can go back to um, yeah. yeah, stop the screen sharing. Um, guys, can um, if you could put your questions, please, in the chat box, and then I'll, I'll come to people. Um, sorry for the interruptions. That was the first time we've had to contend with that. But, uh, <laughs> I um, think I, it was uh, also quite funny, honestly. <laughs> I suspect you're in a Scalbert personally, but uh, I, I don't have any proof of this. Um, uh, I mean, maybe I, I could come to, uh, you'd, you'd mentioned uh, at the beginning that, that you, you would, you'd watched Irene's presentation from last week, which touched on this theme of architecture and politics. C could you, um, and you, that you've had ultimately a kind of quite a different position, could you describe a little about the, 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 the divergence of views there's a play there. Uh, well, what what I um, I mean, uh, what what I remember from Irene's uh, contribution uh, is uh, an argument in favor of uh, reducing uh, architecture to one of the so-called minor uh, arts, 
And I agree with him that the confusion with the so-called minor art has been a problem in uh, recent architectural theory and production. Uh, but I wouldn't solve it uh, the way he proposes by joining the minor arts, but just simply going back to having literally nothing to do with the minor arts. I, I think there's nothing to, and I, I mean, if there's a discipline that uh, uh, always benefited uh, architecture, uh, let's say the contact of the two disciplines was positive for architecture. For me, that's painting, but certainly not sculpture and certainly not uh, the so-called minor arts. Irene, I think you've got a, a question, but maybe also you yeah, can come back on that. Yeah. Um, um, my, I suppose, well, I mean, I, I think you, you understood what I was saying um, when, you, when you listened to me. And I mean, my, my feeling is that, or my view is that uh, architects in recent years have been so interested in making great works that this singular objective has marginalized the profession in society and has uh, diminished actually the power of architects. And so when I, when I suggest that uh, architecture uh, should be demoted, that it should be made more minor, what I have in mind is that uh, it would re-emphasize the professional side of architecture, as opposed to uh, putting the emphasis on the aesthetic side of architecture. And at the end, I, I really do feel, but there are, there are exceptions, I really do, do feel and think that uh, if, there, if the architect ever has any power, it is going to be a professional power. It is going to be a particular skill through which uh, certain things can change and perhaps even make life better. But as you, I think as you rightly pointed out, Pier Paolo, there, there are exceptions such as Bramante, because Bramante uh, had a reputation of being a terrible builder, in other words, of he being terrible. a terrible professional. Uh, and at the same time, as you rightly say, uh, has proved to be immensely influential, and even I uh, very much like his work. You know. um, we have a next question from um, Matteo. Um, hang on, I need to unmic you. Uh, Matteo, yeah. you've got the microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Matteo, I work as an architect here in London. Uh, I was just interested in knowing your opinion about uh, when basically architecture for particular historical circumstances becomes associated with specific uh, uh, political uh, messages or political currents. Uh, as for example, in, uh, for Italian Russianism or the architecture of uh, Piacentini during uh, Italian fascism or other kind of examples, historical examples. Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's certainly part of the of this conversation. Uh, the, there are two things, I guess. Uh, the the first thing, um, well, trying to, to to quickly answer because it's not something that you can quickly solve. But um, one one thing uh, is the the time frame of architecture. Uh, that that I think is something we should consider uh, with attention, and I I think we we didn't really consider uh, um, properly in the last twenty thirty years. Uh, that means that in general, architecture lasts more than uh, human beings. Um, 
this means that architecture is fundamentally something unreliable. So you do it for certain scopes and then it is used for others. Uh, th this is why I think a symbolistic or uh, understanding of architecture doesn't make sense because the symbols last on top of architecture for very, very few time. And, uh, and in, in, in the long term architecture, you, you don't really know what it would be associated with. Um, just to speak of fascism, uh, probably one of the three, four buildings associated with fascism that would come to, to your mind is uh, Milan train station. But Milan train station was, was uh, designed and begun to build some 20 years before. So it's this labeling and association of certain political intentions to certain buildings is very uh, unreliable. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's not entirely, I think in a way, uh, it's very difficult to understand architecture as a media. On, on one way, it is uh, the, 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 the things it can communicate, it's so limited. Uh, then all other me medias are much more efficient and, uh, and, and quick and reliable. So understanding architecture uh, the way, I don't know, Venturi Scott Brown proposed to understand it in the, in the later part of their career, to me is not particularly interesting. Also because if architecture is that, then uh, why don't we all move to a more interesting uh, discipline where you can do more? Like if the problem is really to communicate through architecture, why don't you give up architecture and move to writing novels or uh, movies or whatever? Architecture is for people who are interested in these specific uh, lack of uh, reliability. Uh, there is lack of reliability that exists in the long term. Uh, and without this uh, sympathy for slowness and uh, again, unreliability, I don't think you have great sympathy for architecture. Like you, you need this strange combination of passion for long term and bad jokes in the long term in order to like architecture. Um, Simon Innes, next up. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Pierre, for um, a story about St. Peter's that uh, I didn't know. Um, I think it was Nietzsche who said that, um, that the arbiters of taste in history have very often been those who are rich in money. Um, or rich in time, um, and very often an architect's choice um, is who they work for and what commissions they take on. And I wonder whether you would see that as being a strongly political act when an architect chooses to work for one client or one cause or another. Uh, and an example that, that strings, springs to my mind is Ralph Erskine. Um, who did, I think, deliberately carve out not so much a, a particularly strong aesthetic line, but chose which particular clients that he would work for through his career. Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, with all respect for these choice uh, as uh, political choices by by a citizen that are very, well, remarkable. I think in terms of architecture, and if you follow what the, the argument that I tried to develop, architects are, they should work for whatever son of a bitch, like they, it's part of their morality, I would say. Uh, the, the, the architecture has been built through history for the most horrible people. Uh, 
I mean, I, I don't think Julius II was this horrible person, but certainly it wouldn't really qualify uh, as uh, uh, like a model politician by contemporary standards. But and he is not even the worst. Like think of whatever Roman emperor and so forth. Um, so I think if you understand uh, architecture in uh, in the terms I try to argue, so as uh, an intellectual uh, operation and fundamentally as an art. Uh, I would say you're legitimate to uh, to work for anybody, and actually the the morality is really doesn't lie there. It's the morality is in the way in which you do the work. It's not in the uh, selection of the people for whom uh, you do the work. Uh, then I think in real life there might be moments in which this theory is a bit too much. So uh, uh, personally, I can tell you that I, I've been work, working for any possible uh, client that approached us, including situations uh, maybe uh, a bit iffy. Uh, uh, the only situation in which I decided I would not do that, uh, that was Saudi Arabia. I decided not to work in Saudi Arabia. But that's just a personal, uh, let's say, story. And, and, they, they, and I mentioned only to, to say that there are uh, different circumstances. Anyhow, this is a question that would never appear uh, in the mind of an architect before uh, at least the, 90, the second half of the 19th century. I think before uh, socialism as a, as a big mass movement with, with intellectuals related to it and so forth, no architect would ever consider, oh, should I do this or should... So it, it would be incredibly unfair to judge architecture uh, of uh, let's say, Renaissance or, or before, according to that standard. Uh, Pier Paolo, thank you so much. I'm going to unmute everybody so we can have a round of applause. And... Um, so yeah, we've got one more session today, which is at nine o'clock over on our Instagram um, live account. There's a, a reading of um, a text by MFK Fisher, um, an interesting American uh, food writer. Um, and then later in the week, we have Kate McIntosh is going to be talking. Um, and we have um, Ken Warpole is going to be talking about Colin Ward. Um, and Jeremy Till is doing a session, so that it's quite a busy week. You'll find the full schedule over on the Architecture Foundation website. Um, Pier Paolo's um, a piece will be, uh, this, this last hour will be up live on um, our YouTube account tomorrow, so do please um, um, send, send details to anyone who you think might be interested. Pier Paolo, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, on the other side of uh, of this current um, current moment. All right. Um, stay stay safe, everyone, and uh, catch up with you soon. Take care.